My key, key area of research is innovation. Um, in particular, I'm interested in social networks. Um, I'm interested in where ideas come from. And I may have said to you already, I used to work for Hewlett Packard. And I used to work in the um, software development area of producing new products. And one of the things that used to fascinate me about um, Hewlett Packard and the lab I worked in was that although we had formal teams, it was quite clear that most of the communication happened outside of those teams with people who weren't, you weren't formally connected to. And there were all sorts of things going on in Hewlett Packard that had nothing to do with um, the formal projects we were on. Um, we were communicating with people that we weren't necessarily in our team. So often if you wanted advice, you'd go to people who, you, who weren't necessarily your boss or your colleagues. So during the time I was at um, Hewlett Packard, I became very interested in um, the informal, really. And in 1989, I went to do a full-time MBA, 20 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, I did a full-time MBA. And um, one of the modules on that program was innovation. And uh, someone on that course um, was talking about, well, the, most of that course was actually about how we organize for innovation. And it was all about the formal organizational structure, the formal process, as if somehow all of this mattered. Um, so I, I felt a, a bit of a gap here between my experience in a very, very innovative company, where obviously formal structure and formal process mattered, but quite clearly informality also mattered. So it, I was on this MBA program being told that you, know, you all need to organize in this way with these formal structures, with this formal process for taking an idea from here to commercialization. So having done that course, I ended up doing a PhD actually on informality, on social networks. Um, and subsequently my whole research really is around social networks, increasingly around serendipity, luck, um, informality. And in my PhD, I was basically exploring informal relationships, where ideas came from in successful innovations. And what you find is that um, many, many ideas actually come through informal routes. You know, we, we talk a lot about in business and on MBAs about joint ventures, alliances, and all this sort of stuff. But we seem to forget that actually it's people that make up organizations and people that communicate with one another. And ideas transfer through people, not through technology, not through joint alliances. And even when we talk about joint alliances or joint ventures, they only work when people work together, when people talk to each other. So a lot of the cases, I, for my PhD, I looked at about 50 cases of innovation. Um, small firms, large firms, they'd all won what we called a Queen's Award. Um, the Queen's got nothing to do with it, actually, but uh, they call it the Queen's Award for Technology. They'd all won the Queen's Award for Technology, which is an indication that they've been both technologically successful, i.e. they've come up with something very innovative and new, but also they've been commercially successful. So they were both commercially and innovative and successful. And it was interesting that both in the, the very large well-organized organizations, the informal sources were very important. And in particular, they were very important for small firms who weren't structured in quite a formal way and didn't have the same resources as larger organizations. One concept or one idea that became very, very interesting was the idea of boundary spanning, i.e. ideas that cross over boundaries are very, very interesting. Um, so, for example, do you know the James Dyson vacuum cleaner? Yeah, um, it's only in certain countries. But basically, it works in a completely different way from the original Hoover. It works with a vortex. Um, and it's, it was the first major innovation, really, since the original Hoover in, in, in um, vacuum cleaner technology. And however, although that idea was very, very new and therefore transformed the vacuum cleaner um, sector. It was actually an old idea. It was an idea that had been drawn from 
uh, dust extraction above machines in, in industry for many years. So an old idea crosses a boundary into a new sector and becomes something radical. Um, so I'm going on a little bit of a tangent here, but actually when we think about innovation, when we think about newness, we need to think about boundaries. Because what's new to me may not be new to you, and vice versa. And ideas that cross boundaries can be very powerful. Um, and ideas that come together from different places can be very powerful. And the combination of ideas from different places can be very powerful. And quite often the way that ideas cross boundaries, whether that's an organisational boundary, a sectoral boundary, a national boundary, um, a boundary between the private sector and the public sector, or between the private sector and the, the NGO sector, these are interesting boundaries. And when, when, when ideas transfer, you can end up with innovation. And those boundary, that boundary crossing is often through social networks, through individuals meeting um, socially, building their relationships, whatever. So that's one of the concepts that um, I think is extremely important. And organisations, quite typically, um, do not encourage boundary spanning, actually. Organisations tend to compartmentalise us. They put us into functions. We're organised into functions. We're organised into divisions that deliver products and services to certain markets. We're organised into divisions that focus on particular technologies. Successful innovation company, innovative companies try to find ways of bridging that, but nevertheless, even innovative companies tend to compartmentalise. So one of the things that we need to do when we're thinking about innovation is how do we encourage um, that, that boundary spanning? And I'm going to argue today that it's not just about formal structures, it's actually about informal structures to help us do that. In fact, to set up a formal structure that crosses all sorts of boundaries um, would yield, would bring about a very unyieldly organisation, a very complex organisational structure. The great thing about social networks is they're incredibly sophisticated and complex and messy, but actually they just emerge. You don't need to plan them, they just emerge. And you might be able to, um, one of the things we will talk about, or what I'll talk about today, is how we encourage them to emerge. You can't manage social networks, you can't manage serendipity, but you can find ways of organising that encourage social networks, that encourage serendipity. Now you might think it's a bit oxymoronic that you, somehow you can create luck, but you can create, you can influence contexts that are, create more luck than others. You can create contexts that constrain informality and others that encourage it. You can uh, create contexts which encourage boundary spanning and others that prevent it. Just a brief comment to give an example of that. Um, a few years ago, I used to work at Aston Business School and I taught a course, a, a sort of first year course on management. And I had this project I had with Rover, which used to be a British company based in Birmingham. And um, I got basically the various managers to come into the, into the school. And then one of the managers was uh, talked about innovation and I had a chat with him. And it was quite interesting because they had a really big site called Longbridge, which is near, in, in Birmingham. And they had um, a manufacturing building, a design building, and an R&D building, which is actually in a different city. And the communication between those was extremely poor because not only were these departments which should be talking to each other in the innovation process in separate departments, but they also had the physical boundaries of buildings, the walls um, that divided these. And so perhaps one of the reasons why companies like Rover failed eventually and one of the reasons they weren't, uh, weren't particularly innovative might be because they didn't actually know how to communicate and weren't communicating between the different functions. Innovation is not successful simply by R&D um, or uh, a service development department developing something and passing it to the marketing to sell. It has to be different departments communicating with each other and with customers and with other 
actors to come up with something new from the very start. So it's not, innovation isn't something that is successful whereby simply passing it over the wall to the next function and then expecting marketing to sell it to customers. An alternative example which has been extremely successful in the, in the automobile industry in the UK is McLaren. Um, did I mention this a couple of days ago? I can't remember if I did. Um, one of the MBAs I taught on the full-time program recently used to work for McLaren. And I don't know if you know at the moment, McLaren are top of the championship um, in terms of points for Formula One. Um, McLaren is actually a set of organisations, a set of companies that used to be distributed um, in different towns in the sort of region between, I think, London, Oxford, Reading, sort of, sort of west of London, basically. And recently, they, well, a few years ago, they were, a huge amount of money was, was um, invested in a new building that brought all of these companies together. And each company had a separate street. And within this building, and I'll show you a picture of it in a bit, actually, and what happened is, um, I guess at different points of the day, in the morning or the evening when people started to finish work, or when they went for lunch, they would come down their street and they would have to go down a different street to go to a restaurant. And by coming out of their streets, which were company-based, they would bump into people from other departments or other organisations. You know, maybe one's making the engine, one's making the, um, the wheels. But all these components need to work together when you're working with um, extremely sophisticated products like a Formula One car in a very highly competitive, innovative market. Now, th this building was designed to, to actually encourage interaction and uh, serendipity and boundary spanning because as people came out of the building, they would bump into people from other companies <coughs> um, and they would then have conversations that they didn't plan to have. Prior to this, what would happen is people from these different organisations, they would have a formal meeting that would set, set up with someone else in a different uh, organisation because they had to drive there. And if you're going to drive there, you have to set an appointment, you have to set an agenda, and straight away you're narrowing the discussion down. And what they found is by bringing them to com companies together, although they obviously still had meetings of agendas, they also had serendipitous meetings where you'd bump into someone and when you bump into someone without an agenda, who knows what you might say and who knows what the conversation, where the conversation might lead. So when I was talking to this MBA who used to work for McLaren, he said that it actually, you know, some of these conversations went nowhere, they were social, but some led to some really interesting ideas and, and concepts. So in other words, this, this, this building, this architecture, shaped the way that people interacted, that ultimately um, led to uh, the sharing of ideas. So two examples in the automobile industry in Britain with very different um, outcomes. And it seems to me in these two cases, architecture played a key role. Another example of architecture playing a key role is when I used to work for Hewlett Packard, I moved, uh, moved um, offices. The first six months or 12 months I was in a beautiful building, low-rise uh, grounds. It basically had one floor, um, open plan. And uh, there's a lot of communication, a lot of social networks that, that people built. It had a single canteen. I then moved to um, another town with a different building. And actually, it was in a high-rise flat, basically, with about 12 storeys. And each, each storey had, um, each floor had a different department. And what you found is the communication was very good on each floor, but very poor between different floors. Um, so when, when we're talking about organisational culture and when we're talking about companies setting culture, we have to also think that those cultures have to match the buildings and the architecture that they, they reside in. So Hewlett Packard had a culture that was encouraging of informality, uh, knocking other people's doors and talking to them. But you put that culture in a building that doesn't allow that and it doesn't happen. So you have to have a match between culture and architecture. Okay, so that's lots of waffle and um, <laughs> we haven't even started. What I want to do is look at three areas. I want to start off by talking a little bit about the way that what's called the new product